Martin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I mean, we, we emailed Martin in summertime and uh, um, we welcomed him earlier two years ago or two, three years to ago. Stand up, to Start Up Turkey in yes. uh, Atalanya. In Antalya, it was uh, Antalya, uh, right? Two, two years ago. Two years ago. So uh, Martin uh, made this time as well. So we are very happy. Uh, Martin also works with Turkey. So he will tell more. Stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, for attending. Uh, we have about an hour or how is it, 50 minutes. And uh, th this is supposed to be interactive. So please make sure that you interrupt and ask questions because I have a lot of slides, but it's not like a law of nature that I have to go through all the slides. It's just uh, slides that are there if nobody is asking any questions. Uh, but what I'm trying to do, what I'll try to do uh, in the presentation is give you some kind of flavor of how uh, angel investment takes place in the Nordics. Uh, because I think to a large extent that's something uh, that uh, other places can learn from, especially also because the Nordics is uh, sort of in the periphery of Europe. Uh, it's, it's a place where we've had to sort of establish our, our own way of doing things while listening to how things are done everywhere else, especially like in the previous presentation, how th things are done in the EU, uh, sorry, in the, in the US. Uh, but, but to a large extent, we've been able to sort of have our own uh, uh, angel investment scene with a Nordic characteristic being built the last couple of years that I think... Uh, to some extent, can be something that, that we can exchange information about and learn from each other about here. <coughs> Let me just see here. So I'm going to say something about uh, why the Nordics are actually relevant to look at, uh, not just from how to organize, how to have a startup investment scene working, but also maybe something about building an ecosystem that can be relevant for, for you guys here in, in Turkey and in the, uh, in the Turkish neighborhood. Uh, and uh, finally, I'm going to spend maybe the most time on actually digging a little bit into, or somewhat a lot into, how you can, within the legal framework, try to uh, lower the transaction cost of actually making these early stage investments. And I think this is very relevant here also. Uh, I'm, I'm from a law firm called uh, Bird and Bird. And we have uh, a best friend law firm here in Istanbul called BTS. Uh, and I just had a meeting with these guys yesterday and I could see that they were actually trying to develop some of the same kind of ideas, how you can do, I would call it sort of like a legal hack uh, to figure out how you can, within a system that might be somewhat cumbersome and cost, uh, costly, you can do things, enabling these things to happen in a way that is much less expensive. Uh, and just also to give you a background for my, about myself, uh, I, 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 I do this presentation partly uh, as a lawyer, but, but I've spent, I, I, to be honest, the reason I am, why I'm a lawyer is that I had an internet company uh, in the 90s and we exited at that wrong side at the dot-com bubble. Uh, that is after it burst, so uh, we didn't make a lot of money, so I had to continue being a lawyer. That's why I'm a lawyer today and not uh, primarily an investor. <coughs> But I spent a lot of time uh, with both the community, uh, the startup community uh, in, in the Nordics, uh, but I also spent some time actually doing some investment. And uh, uh, we, we built a couple of years ago something called NordicMakers.vc. You can go to the website there. And this is a, actually a group of Nordic uh, business angels. I'm definitely the lightweight kind of guy there. It's the founder of Unity, the founders of Sendesk, the founders of Just Eat, uh, and these kind of companies where it's Danish and Nordic entrepreneurs who have decided to get back to the community and reinvest some of their money. And they needed some, some guy that could actually get all those big egos to sit in a room and, and organize it, so that was me. Uh, so I'm part of that, so I also do uh, quite a number of, of small investments in startups in, uh, in, in the Nordics. And finally, uh, I, I've been working a lot with uh, the organization of the community uh, around eco uh, the ecosystems around tech startups in the Nordics. Uh, if you go to that hashtag CPHFTW, uh, Copenhagen for the win, uh, you will see that uh, the whole Copenhagen and southern Sweden uh, ecosystem are ac is actually uh, coalescing around that hashtag. Uh, that's where you get all the news, that's where you post all the news of what was going on. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that if we got time. 
And then underlying it all is that uh, I have a very sort of open source advocacy approach. Uh, if there's one thing I actually think that I know something about, it's open source uh, and open business, creative commons and things like that. Uh, so uh, almost running through all the other things is the idea that uh, you can make more money, you can have more business, you can have more uh, better functioning markets, you can have a more democratic markets and so on, if there's more transparency, if there's more sharing, and you make money on top of that. So that underlies all of it. So let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, the Nordics, because it seems uh, that, I mean, for, for a lot of people, uh, people will say, oh, I mean, you're from Copenhagen. Copenhagen is the, is that a, the capital in Sweden, or is it the... Uh, something, something in Iceland or something like that, and that's totally okay, uh, because most of the startups there will say, well, we're not a Danish company or a Swedish company, we are Nordic companies. Uh, and uh, it's, it's funny because, I mean, you, if you go to Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, uh, and Norway, you'll find that it's more or less the same. Uh, we have the same kind of uh, culture, uh, we speak more or less the same language. The Finns are a little bit different, they, they have a language that nobody understands but the Finns, uh, but the rest of us is more or less like uh, brothers and sisters, and, and you have, in, in, a, in a family, you always have a lot kind of love-hate relationship. You love your, your, your family because uh, you, it's your family, but you also hate them, and there's a lot of competition. The Denmark and Sweden has been, uh, it's the two countries in the world that has been at war with each other for the longest time. <laughs> Sorry? Sweden, yeah. Uh, but it's also, I mean, a lot of my family are, are Swedes, and uh, and some of my family is Norwegian, and so on. So it's it's, I guess it's like everywhere. You have a cultural, uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't know, but it, but uh, I I told that it's actually the the longest standing uh, war, uh, periods where officially there has been declared war. It's been going on since uh, eight the eight hundred or something like that. Uh, but but nowadays it's uh, it's different. <laughs> no no it's that we we had borderless uh, borders borderless borders for for a very long time because before the EU there was actually a Nordic Union, and most of our laws are the same. Uh, they built. They, there was a joint Nordic commissions in the early last century building these laws, uh, and uh, I think to to some extent we say that the Nordics, yeah, we are different countries, but we're more like a region, uh, and uh, you could also say that that a little bit like Silicon Valley or other places, you'd say that well, instead of saying San Diego is is a different part or something else, uh, San Francisco, it's part of the same kind of region, and then you have hubs. And the Nordics, you would say, Copenhagen, Helsinki, and Stockholm. And there again, I'm, I'm making a lot of enemies of my Norwegian friends. So they would say, oh, obviously also Oslo, but not really. <laughs> but uh, there's no, nobody from Norway here, right? No, great. Uh, but but, but uh, again, uh, you would say that, that the startups are Nordic startups, but they're just in one of the hubs. Just like you would say in other regions. And a lot of the, th this is actually the symbol uh, of, of uh, the recent uh, 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 wave of integration is the, this, the bridge between Denmark and Sweden that was built, I think, 20 years ago. And that bridge has meant that there has been so much integration uh, between Malmö, which is the second largest, uh, maybe second or third largest city in, in Sweden, and Copenhagen. A lot of, uh, when you go take the, the train to Malmö and Lund, you will uh, be accompanied by tons of young Danes going to study in Lund or Malmö University. If you go the other way, way there are tons of young Swedes going to work in Copenhagen. Uh, so it's, uh, and I, at my law firm, there's a lot of young associates that actually live in Malmö and then commute over the bridge to Copenhagen. And, uh, and uh, the, the, only, the only problem with that border has been actually uh, two years ago uh, at the height of the refugee crisis where the Swedes uh, decided to close the border and say, no, we're, no, we're closing. Uh, obviously, the most, uh, besides Germany, the most friendly uh, uh, country to refugees in Europe uh, said, now we're going to close it down. And that meant that it was really a problem for the, for, for the, for the cost of doing business uh, across uh, the two. It's this this uh, stretch of, of water is called the Ura Sound, uh, like sound, like a strait. Uh, and this is also where up here you have 
uh, Elsinore Castle, the place where Hamlet resided uh, many years ago. But this, this is more like uh, a symbol of, of how much things are integrated, and it's very integrated today, also in the startup scene, where you're seeing a lot of Finnish investors investing in Danish companies and the other way around. Here you can also see something that, that actually, if you combine it, it's a very, very small place in the sense that, that uh, uh, we only combined about 26 million, uh, which would be uh, like, like Istanbul and surroundings. Uh, but but uh, we, we're just 26 people, but nevertheless, uh, if, you, uh, if you include Greenland, <laughs> we're seven, uh, it's the seventh largest uh, uh, country or, or uh, play, uh, area in the world. But it's, a, it's, it's not really big, uh, but it's, it's okay. It's, I mean, combined, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's punching beyond its weight. Uh, yeah, uh, we actually talked about that. There is a lot of, uh, there is already an internal market. Uh, the legal infrastructure is more or less the same. We also, besides the fact that we actually uh, speak more or less the same language, everybody speaks English. So, so it's it's very common to just switch to English, uh, especially among you, young people. My 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 son, uh, who's 12, is out there. Uh, he when he was sorry seven or eight, uh, he, he he was able to speak English even though they didn't have it in school at that time, but just because they're so exposed to, to English culture for better and for worse. Uh, and e all those three, those five markets are, 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 uh, are known for having minimal corruption. I think all of them are very high in the, the Transparency International Index and so on, which also makes it pretty easy to do, do things across borders. There's a lot of internal trading. I think beside Germany, Sweden is our biggest, Denmark's biggest trading partner. Uh, and something that applies for all of these countries are that they are large exporters. Every country in itself, especially a place like Denmark, know that we are a small, shitty little country. That we can never dictate on everybody else, anybody else that they should, uh, I mean, our internal markets is nothing. Five million people, so we have to export. And the whole reason why the economy is doing okay is that from the beginning, those countries have been known as people who had to export. You could never, like the French or the Germans or the Americans, say, no, we just cross the border, close the borders, and then we're doing fine with our own internal market. Because that could never have worked there, and that's part of the culture. Uh, and also just some numbers here. Uh, it's, it's interesting when the Americans say that, that the Nordics are socialism, then on almost all the issues, uh, we are more uh, capitalistic than the Americans. Uh, it's it's uh, the ease of doing business, innovation. In all these areas, uh, the Norwegians are top achievers in the world, probably the, the best region uh, in the world. Sorry for bragging, but, uh, but when you pay so high taxes, there has to be something to brag about. <laughs> uh, and uh, if you go in to look at these indexes, you will see that it's actually uh, extremely... Uh, we're doing pretty well there. So, uh, what does this mean for, for, for tech startups? And I think there, there's a very interesting, I mean, uh, my point is here not just to brag, but also to let you see that there is actually a reason why you should look at how things are being done there, because you can actually learn something from how to create an environment, an ecosystem for successful startups. Uh, because when you look at it, uh, there's really, really, a huge number of successful startups that have come out of, of Scandinavia within, within a broad range of sectors. It's not like we're just good within hardware or something else, but when all, within all the different areas, you have uh, world-class companies that have been actually founded uh, or where the founders have come out of Scandinavia. Uh, and this we talked about uh, before, that, that uh, these companies are Nordic, they are not really uh, Danish or Swedish or Finnish, Finnish or so on. And they, 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 they have this advantage that they, they have this market internally where there's a lot of friction and competition. Uh, but because they have from the beginning the understanding that they have to be global, they are born global, they're born regional, but they're also born global. And that, that, that mindset is, is really uh, advantageous. Um, and I think that, that um, the, the, the being, having this kind of home turf where there's a lot of competition, where you have stability, 
where you have a, a, a growth model in society where it's not like it's going up and then the banks are collapsing and it's going down, but it's going to it's kind of gr uh, a sustainable growth. Uh, there's there's uh, there's ease and quiet and peace on the home front means that you 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 have an advantage when you're actually trying to build uh, a company. Obviously, you could argue that you become a better entrepreneur if you're if you're working out of a war zone. But but I, I think that there is actually a good uh, argument that if you have sort of a stable environment at home, you can you can you you can you can actually have this kind of uh, uh, um, peace and quiet that enables you to build a, a, a good startup. And I also can see that we have actually a number of Turkish people who have come to Copenhagen or Sweden not because they are they are second generation uh, immigrants from from uh, eight, uh, from uh, guest workers, but they actually came. For instance, for Istanbul, from Istanbul to do their startup there because they were the ease of doing business, the access to capital, uh, and these kind of things were actually easier. One of my good friends is a, is a Turkish guy called Adam Overchik who who founded Donkey Republic, uh, and uh, he started his company here in uh, in Copenhagen. I, I did a presentation like this, and he came up and said, "How do I set up my company? We can do it like this the, the moment afterwards." And and uh, obviously, I mean the. Uh, the I, I think I think that he has found that actually being uh, being able to do that out of that environment has been beneficial for him. Obviously, if you're doing a bike sharing thing, it's also easier to do it in Copenhagen than in Istanbul. I can tell from my own experience, having been here a couple of days. <laughs> so so, but 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 it it it, it gives a, an advantage, and also. Uh, what is happening now, right now is that there is actually a lot of funding around. Uh, there's actually we are actually in a situation where there is uh, both a lot of good talent uh, coming uh, to 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 pitch their ideas, but there's increasingly a lot of money being uh, looked into to to uh, being being employed uh, in 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 Scandinavia and the Nordics. I think it's interesting. Still, we have a relatively unsophisticated local VC scene. And I can say that here because there are no local Danish <laughs> VCs or Swedish VCs, but it's still relatively uh, unsophisticated. But increasingly, we are seeing the index, the uh, Baldertons, the benchmarks, and these coming to Copenhagen, coming to the region uh, because of the, the, the leverage of these, these four or five countries coming to one of the hubs and looking into investing uh, directly, uh, not asking them necessarily to go to the US before they invest them, but actually investing them directly uh, in, in, uh, in the local market. Uh, and uh, this is interesting because I think this has been happening partly because all the geopolitical and, and uh, characteristics of, of, of uh, the Nordics that we just went through, but more importantly because there is more, more smart angel money. Because a lot of the successes that we have seen in the, the recent years, those who have built unicorns exited and they've, they've come back and they've started to reinvest. And I think this is really the key to the relative success uh, of the Nordics is that you are seeing now the last five, six, seven years that a lot of these recent, relatively recent entrepreneurs and all of, also relatively recent uh, uh, people with exits have uh, began to deploy their money uh, back uh, in their own uh, home, uh, at their home, back at the uh, at the Nordics, and that has also meant that, that there's much less dependency on government money, and I think that might be a, a chance here, uh, like a lot of other places, that that the startup scene is to a large extent something that you look to the to government and say, can you give us some grant? Could you put up some funds? Can you hold some events or something like that? So it becomes not really something that's for startups by startups. Uh, regarding startups, but it's something done for some big shot from a governor who can who can uh, 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 come and say that I'm doing something for startups. Please vote for me. Uh, so, 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 and this is really, really important. But finally, the problem is that we are still seeing uh, that if you want to exit as a Danish startup or a Swedish startup or a Nordic, uh, Norwegian startup, it's still very difficult to do it on the local market. You still have to find the Googles, the Apples, or the IPO uh, in, in London, or the IPO at NASDAQ, or, 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 or an IC, uh, or another trades here, because there, there is a relatively weak market for IPOs in the Nordics. Something is happening there, but not in anywhere close to the, to the capitalizations that we see otherwise. Uh, uh, and I can say that it's, it's, it's not the best companies that, I, that are IPOing in the Nordics. It's, 
it's to a certain extent those who cannot get funding anywhere else. Uh, and uh, if local players, local uh, Swedish companies have to buy one of these companies, the, the amount that they are paying is not nearly the same as the Apples or the Amazons would, uh, or, or the Microsoft would give, simply because uh, these people don't have that much money and they still have the idea that there should be some like a discounted cash flow idea about how to, to, to value uh, uh, startups. Here's just an example uh, of, of interesting companies coming out of, of uh, the Nordics the last couple of years. I mean, this is just some of them, but you can see that this, these are super companies that are world-class companies in their own uh, fields. Um, actually, Sendesk, do you know Sendesk? This, uh, 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 it's, uh, this was done by the, the internet company that I founded, uh, was together with the two founders of Sendesk. And uh, after they start, after I became a lawyer, and they uh, sort of were rock bottom uh, and, and didn't have anything to do, they started two new companies that I'd invest in. They went broke. Then they came with a third one, which was sent as a second. Do you want to invest in that? I said, no, no, and th this one. Now, now, I don't want to do anymore. <laughs> so, so here's a caveat. Uh, I can give you a lot of information, but don't trust investment advice for me because I'm I'm totally lousy. Uh, another guy. I had uh, close uh, connections with uh, was a guy uh, meeting. Uh, we had a, a couple of meetings in 2004 or five in an investment club, and there was this tall guy who was sort of had had a building fault on his eye. I was speaking in a very strange way and had this idea of a voice over IP thing. And we said, ah, that's been done. There's always the instant messenger from Microsoft. Or they, they don't do that. And that was Janus from Skype. Uh, so so it's. <laughs> Don't, I mean, the biggest waiver here is don't ever take my investment advice. <laughs> uh, but let me just uh, go very quickly through this. Uh, obviously, this is numbers from 20, uh, 2015, and the source is Grandum, a uh, pan-Nordic uh, VC, so the numbers will surely look uh, have a bias towards showing that the Nordics are doing quite okay. But... Uh, the, 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 the interesting thing is here, you can see that even though that the population of the Nordics is, is very small compared to the rest of Europe, uh, you can see that uh, there is some, some really substantial evidence that the Nordics are punching beyond their weight. Uh, not just in the Nordics, but you will also see uh, European-wide. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to see how, how many of these unicorns, and I, I know that statistics are uh, always, will always be able to be biased towards those who are actually putting the, together the statistics. So take it with a grain of salt, but, but, but I think the statistics as they are shown here are correct. It might not be that if you had some different parameter, they would not be as, as good, but, but, uh, but, but the numbers are supposed to be correct. And the thing is here is that, that you can, these numbers, and you can get the, the, uh, the slides afterwards, but the point here is that these numbers actually shows that uh, the, the, the compared with the relative GDP and the relative uh, si the size of the economy and the population, the unicorns coming out the last 10 years from uh, the Nordics, and maybe they stopped in 2015 because if you took 2016 and 17, 18, it wouldn't be as well. But I mean, take just take my word from 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 10 years uh, uh, until 2015. This actually was uh, better than anywhere else in the world, even uh, Silicon Valley, when you compare it to the size of the economy, and the uh, investment made and uh, the po uh, population. I'm just going to go, yeah, uh, uh, but, but the, the point is basically here that, that something must be done right up there because if you can get so much money for your investment with a relatively slow, low investment compared to other places, then there must be some, something around that model that is actually working. We have a lot of, uh, I, I think key to this is to have three things, uh, to have a relatively strong ecosystem for the startups, so the startups can actually work together, share information, uh, feel that they are not, uh, that they, they go to meetings, they share uh, experience, so they have this kind of leverage where they can actually uh, uh, be sure that if something can be done better together, instead of in, in silos or isolated, they get together. And I think we've been 
okay now uh, in trying to, to, to organize the Nordic startup community still, in my opinion, there's still a bit too much government money involved still, and a little bit too much co corporate money involved still. I mean, corporate money is only there because it's PR, because there's somebody saying at the corporate level that we got to do something with startups. Everybody is talking about innovation through startups, so let's do that. And then they, and they don't really change their business. They ask their PR and marketing uh, department saying, can we spend some money on doing an incubator or an accelerator? And it will be dead after two or three years, because uh, after then, there's a consultancy firm like Deloitte or McKinsey saying that you should be innovative in a different way. Uh, and, and this is just what happened when the dot-com bubble burst. There were all these incubators and accelerators. Before that happened, they closed down immediately afterwards. So, so the idea is to have these kind of startup communities that are actually sustainable. And the only way you could do this is actually that you try to the largest extent possible to rid them from corporate money and government money, but actually making sure that you provide value for the startups uh, all the time not value for the PR departments or not value for the government bureaucrats, but value for the startups. And the best things to do, the best way to achieve this is obviously to have the startups actually be the organizers and not some, some consultants hired by, by the state. You should go, I mean, there's, uh, the, there is the, 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 the slush event in Finland that's in Helsinki that takes place in November this year. It's the far by far the best place to get to know what's going on in the, the Nordics. It's a little bit like this. Uh, and it, it's, I really highly recommend to go there because it's, it's, it's high quality and it's still being organized by some of the students uh, of uh, the, fin uh, the Finnish Technical University who actually got the idea to start with. It's, it's much more commercial now, but, but it's still uh, run on a con uh, con uh, uh, community basis. And if you want to follow what's going on, uh, this, this is something that uh, deals with all of the Nordics. This is us in Copenhagen, Stockholm Tech, and Silicon Fjord, that's uh, Oslo. Um, and just a uh, brief word about Copenhagen for the win. Uh, this was uh, our community in, in Copenhagen and southern Sweden. Uh, startups, four startups, the hashtag, it was actually something we started uh, five or six years ago. This is uh, the first group that started it. Uh, it's actually in my <laughs> in my home. Uh, the, the guy is standing out there laughing. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people are looking at me and laughing as well. Uh, but but uh, this this was the f this was how it all started, and then we we actually were able to to move it into one of the most uh, old school places, which is the stock exchange, and uh, have a lot of meeting also like here in in uh, in rundown factory kind of uh, hip uh, places uh, but it's 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 pretty it's working pretty well now you should go and check it out just a brief uh, copenhagen for the win or cph ftw with the risk of uh, maybe being a little bit uh, um, too nordic and, and straight uh, forward in my my wo my words we had a discussion about what, why, why should we use this silly name? And uh, we said, okay, Copenhagen for the win, but we could call it something else. But there was a, we had a, a vote, and it turned out that this could actually be used in different ways as well. And uh, it turned out that you, when you ask foreigners why they come to Copenhagen, a lot of them would say, well, we come there because we want to go to Christiania. You probably heard about Christiania. Uh, so it's Copenhagen for the weed. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 uh, I this is not in any way some, something that should be termed as a Me Too movement or anything like that. But the fact is that a lot of intelligent Western and Eastern and Southern and Northern uh, educated people they go to Copenhagen because they like uh, the relationship that they get uh, with with uh, girls there because they are highly educated and clever and. Uh, uh, emancipated and, and, and a lot of people from around the world actually think that this is actually a very nice environment to meet somebody to, to, to live with. So a lot of people go there uh, Copenhagen for the women. Uh, and that, that, that's just a fact that if you, if you talk to a lot of young Australians or young uh, Americans, they're there because they met some Danish girls somewhere and they went, moved to Copenhagen. Uh, and this is actually something that we're very proud of because we're proud, proud because it's not because 
uh, uh, some sexist thing. It's just because they, they, they have high, high quality intellectually uh, in, in, in Denmark. It is also uh, Copenhagen for the world, or as my son said when he saw it, he just uh, did a little bit of replacement and said, Copenhagen, what the fuck? <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah, let me just uh, get briefly through this. Um, so, now let's get to, to, the, to, to, to the more technical stuff here. Uh, how can we reinvent angel investment? Because one thing is to work with the ecosystem, try to get that to work. Another thing would be to get sort of the angel investors, the new generation of angel investors to, to, go to, to, to get together. That's what Nordic Makers is all about. But finally, what I've been occupied is how can we actually get investing into startups to become much more costless and seamless. And uh, this is, uh, we, we call it reinventing angel investments, but, but by the end of the day, it's uh, something more akin to Dick the Butcher from Henry VI, part two, act four, scene two, saying, the first thing we'll do, let's kill all the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and this is actually because the mission here is that even though I'm a lawyer, in this, in, within this place of investing, in this space where you're talking early state investing, investing, you shouldn't have lawyers be involved. They are totally counterproductive. And I say that with all due respect to my old profession, because I know that we are not adding value at that at that stage. Uh, what you want is flexibility. You want this to be able to happen extremely quickly. You want it to happen in an agile way. Uh, you want to have the investor, the angel investor, and the startup to quickly get to the same time at the table and not have a long confrontational discussion about what's the valuation, oh, your company is not worth anything, so I want a really good deal. And you start having this hackling, and, but you're supposed to be friends and work at the same time. And if you start your relationship by, by, by bad-mouthing the other as part of a discussion about, for instance, valuation, it's not a good thing. And by the end of the day, there is a lot of these costs that are involved that actually prevent some of these investments to take place. The mission here was that we should actually be able to just have a 10,000 euros investment take place uh, w just like that. And today it couldn't happen because 10,000 euros would be the legal cost. And, and again, I mean, even though we used 100,000 euro investment, if there are lawyers involved, it would probably be between 10 or 15,000 euros in total of cost. And that simply doesn't make sense if you make that an investment that 10 to 15% should be taken out of that immediately to lawyers. And the lawyers are not pretty satisfied because they would have to, even at that price, it's depressed. The hour rate. So, so, so it, the, the mission would be to say, couldn't we devise a system? Uh, couldn't we do, uh, uh, couldn't we find a way where we can actually get the lawyers out of the way? Uh, and and you, could, you could obviously say that this is, is this, why are you doing this, Martin, because you're part of a law firm. But for me, it's pretty obvious that as being part of a rather large law firm where we have stringent structures and things like that, where we always have problems with, with hourly rates uh, and lowering hourly rates, our competitors in this area are mostly local firms that are not just one or two people who can always compete on prices. And there's always somebody who knows somebody who has a friend who studied something, who has a brother who can do something for less money. So the only reason, the only way, my, my analysis to, was to say, we can, I can square the circle, I can do something that every startup likes. And for me, it's much better to say to all these competitors, okay, if you want to compete on price, guys, it's free now. Can you compete with that? Because we can, I was going to make all the money in Series A or at a later stage, but can you come? Uh, uh, so, so now we're just lowering the prices so it becomes free. And then all those uh, small law firms that primarily has the expertise in the initial stage will really get a hard time making money because how can, can, you, can you compete with free? Uh, another uh, aspect is, of course, that, that the more investors you get in these uh, angel deals, the more complicated it comes with respect to lawyers. And I, I also wanted to enable that this row just got together and said, now we want to invest in this startup out there. We don't have to consult six lawyers. We don't have to discuss a lot of different individual terms. Just have to find a very easy way to just go out and sign a term sheet, uh, an investment document, and then it's done. No cost involved. Uh, 
and and uh, yeah, I think I think the the the, the question is of uh, the challenge here is of course that in order to 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 create something new here, the problem is that there is a lot of uh, inexperience on both sides. Most of you guys are probably experienced already, but if you're not. You would sit and say, well, I, I have to talk to a lawyer about this anyway because I don't know what I'm saying yes to. And the, uh, on the other side, the startups, they don't know anything at all. So they would probably have to do the same thing. So in order to do something like that, you have to educate and do it as part of a community effort, not just this guy saying it. I think also uh, a big problem today, and that's... Uh, of, it was a big problem in the Nordics. It's not increasing so much more now that we are trying to do this. But you, you probably have the same problem here as we had, uh, for instance, in Denmark. Somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Jutland, you had uh, a business angel who exited on a uh, car manufacturer dealership. He or she had no clue whatsoever about what he was going to invest in. Uh, and the money that uh, he or she had to invest was relatively low amount. So whenever he was trying or she was trying to get a deal, the only thing that they, that person could contribute was, was hackling and being very, very, uh, you have to, uh, this, this is the price, I got I to gotta get these terms. And uh, this is the only thing that they would understand because they had no clue at all about what they were, were investing in. And that meant that some of these people actually got some extremely stringent terms, which meant that those startups were totally unfundable afterwards because nobody in their sane mind wanted to invest in a company where somebody, an idiot from the middle of nowhere in Jutland, owned 50% of the company. So uh, it, this, this was a big problem for Danish startups and I, I think you have the same problem here if you have somebody from the middle of nowhere, Konya, coming to say, well, <laughs> I want to invest in your company. It's got to be done the same way you have to do it did at uh, City Square in Konya. Uh, that, that, that will never work. and, and even though that you got some money, you could never get funding from anybody afterwards because you would say, why, why do we have to invest in a company where some guys who's, who's totally clueless owns 50% of the company? So we need to make these terms market and international. Yeah, and they, uh, basically uh, the idea here would be to, to, to uh, get more angel investments going, to make more syndication allow higher amounts, so we actually were able to get people together to invest amounts that in the first round be, uh, be comparable to the amounts that you get in Berlin and London and maybe even in, in Silicon Valley, so we would put our startups on par there. Uh, it would be, uh, it would, uh, we would promote less adversarial negotiations, uh, more fair market terms, uh, and we will try to standardize the documents so it would be based on international standards instead of, of uh, local standards somewhere in Denmark that never had any relations to, to international investing. So what we were trying to do is uh, we, we thought, well, the typical annual investment would be, I need to get equity. I need to get some stake in the company that you build. I need to get equity. Some would say, well, I can get that via a convertible note, but I still need to get equity uh, by the end of the day. Uh, and obviously, even though that it's convertible, you have to have that discussion of valuation at the time that you made the investment. And that is, that is a problem because nobody's got a clue what the worth of the company are at that early state. Uh, and you would also have, if you want to have equity, you have to discuss the whole shareholders agreement at that time. But what are our minority rights, what are our visa rights and all these things? And again, you have this adversarial atmosphere there going on. There's a lot of distrust maybe coming up because you feel that somebody's trying to take over your company or you feel that the entrepreneur is trying to hide something from you or, or uh, he doesn't try. There's a lot of, t it's not a very good situation. And again, too many lawyers are involved. So we looked to the US and uh, saw what, what could we actually, what, is there some international standard that we could try to, to build this around? Uh, and we, we tried to say, well, one thing that we know in Denmark is used international, and we can see a lot of the Danish companies that are funded by international investors are using these safe documents that came out of the Y Combinator uh, uh, accelerator in the, in the US. And, and everybody would agree that if there are 2,000 or 10,000 incubators accelerators around the world, then maybe 
They save the 10,000 men, then maybe 9,950 are clueless and are going to be uh, run down because it's just been done because somebody heard that they should do an incubator and they couldn't do a successful startup themselves and they are starting to do an incubator. You probably know, know that here from Turkey that, that those a lot of people who are doing incubators are the people who were not very successful with their own startups. I, I, hopefully I don't <laughs> offend anybody, <laughs> but that's, that's the case in, in Denmark. Uh, a lot of the, the incubators are run by people who are not really successful with their own startups. And when you think about it, when, how the hell can they become successful with the, with the incubator? They can become successful in the sense that they get money f to build the incubator and have... Sorry? No, 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 I said I, I left room for 500 incubators around the world. Yeah, I, I, I know this is a very binary discussion, so either you're good or bad, or either you're clever or an idiot. And there's a lot of things in between, <laughs> I, I totally admit that. So it was, when I say idiots, uh, I, I say it in kind of a, a zero, one kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but let's... But again, I mean, by the end of the day, let's look at how many unicorns are coming out of these incubators. Yeah, yeah, but th 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 this is, my point is, this is the best. Uh, this is the best. I'm just talking about all the followers. Yeah. Let, let's talk about that in five years. Let's talk about five. And I, I, I'm willing to make a bet that uh, you're, you're still not going to see the best startups coming out of incubators. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that this is not true in, uh, for all, but I think it's by far for the majority. Yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, but at least I'm provoking a discussion. <laughs> no, but the point is that the, if there's one incubator or accelerator that is successful, then it's Y Combinator. And they have been using this safe documents, a simple agreement for future equity, uh, successfully, uh, so successful that more or less without any variation, this is the standard for uh, startup, uh, for seed investing uh, around the US. I mean, they're, they're, it's not entirely, but, but we see it almost all the time. And uh, this, th it's very difficult to discuss whether this is not market or standard or it's unserious or something like that. So, so if you go to uh, this guy from, from the middle of nowhere, Jutland, or somewhere in the middle of nowhere here, and pre present the safe document, and they will say, no, no, that's not serious, that you cannot use this document. Then you know that this is because that person is clueless with respect to how things are done internationally uh, and not the other way around. I think we can agree on that. That that uh, uh, and 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 you probably I mean it's probably uh, it's hard to say I've I've had these presentations in Denmark and Sweden where you went into a room with a lot of uh, business angels who were successful with their own companies and then you told them this and of of course it's extremely offending because you're basically saying that if you if you don't understand that these documents are market if you don't understand that these documents are very important for whether your startup can actually get a funding in the second round from a large VC, then you have a problem. Then you, then, uh, and, and I, as somebody who spent most of my time advising startup, I would say uh, to startups, if you go to an investor, you take up these two, two documents, a traditional Danish uh, business angel investment document and this, and then you ask the investors, which one do you want to choose? And then you know if they choose the old-fashioned one, you know that, they're, they're, that at best, at best they're dumb money. But at worst, they're dumb money who think it's smart. Uh, and then you have a big risk of, not, of being unfundable going forward. 
Because you would see that the benchmarks, the, the index, the, the large Nordic funds, they would say, well, no, we, I mean, we're seeing 10 different proposals every day. And one of the reasons, one of the problems, were, one of the ways that we actually uh, are, are screening is uh, uh, taking away at at the first start, those that have a, a fucked up uh, cap table and, and investment terms that we are going to have too much hassle to try to, to clean up. Uh, and this document, everybody knows. So we are building, we have been building this on this basis. You have to know, uh, did you go through all this with, uh, in the previous discussion? No. But the this, this safe documents, they are not debt insurance. It's not that you are lending money to a company. You are actually paying to get the right to uh, have new shares issued at a later site. So they are warrants. It's a warrant document. It's not a, a debt document. You don't get an interest. You don't get to discuss uh, the shareholders agreement because it's a warrant to get the right to subscribe to shares in the future. And you don't have uh, a evaluation on your investment in the beginning. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to wha wha how that is uh, actually doable. Uh, you will only s maybe have a valuation cap to say, well, once I get to subscribe, I don't want to subscribe at a higher price than this. But this valuation cap is not the same as the value at this point. And it also means that you are able with this kind of document to go to this front row uh, and say, well, here's all of you, do you want to invest? And we, we, you, you, can, you can invest, you and you and you, and we can take in the investment immediately. We don't have to have all six of you to invest before we can close the round. It's very flexible. The shares you get, you get them when shares are issued in a future round. And this is very important. You should only use the document if you think that you're investing in a company that will need a second round at a later stage, a serious a Series A round or a, a much higher uh, seed finance round at a later stage. Uh, and what you, what you do here is that you say that once there is a, a new uh, round, uh, this qualified investment taking place in the future, then there's a valuation there. That's what the one we take as the point of departure. The only thing we have to discuss is what discount are we going to get. And that's much easier to say, well, we invest now. If you get 10 million euros in, uh, in two years, then we'll take that evaluation as point of departure because there, there are serious people who are really discussing what it's worth at that time. So we'll take that as point of departure where we want to have 30% discount. That's a much easier discussion to have. And we don't have to discuss what is actually, what liquidation preferences, or what anti-dilution clauses, and all these things, what are we going to get? We can just say, well, when they get their shares, we want to get the exact same rights. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, and the discount uh, obviously exists because uh, if you're basing your valuation on the valuation in the next round, then you need to have some compensation because you took took the risk uh, in the uh, investing considerable time before, and you can say uh, the discount will of course reflect the risk in the sense if you do that and you're not certain that you will get a Series A round uh, in two or three years, then you will ask for a high discount if you actually are doing it more interim uh, or bridge, because there is actually already a term sheet for Series A, then you will ask for a smaller discount. What range do you I'm seeing uh, between, uh, if, there's a, if there is actually a bridge, uh, if there's close to a, to a signed term sheet, it's between 10 and 50%, 10 and 15%. And uh, the, uh, the in, in the other situations, it would be 30 to 35. Uh, but remember, you will only use this if the business case of the company you're investing in is clearly a business case that calls for a next round to take place within a couple of, of years or something like that, 24 months or 36 months or 18 months or something like that. If you're investing in a company that doesn't really need any more money, then you shouldn't use this. Because then there's not going to be this next round. Then it's probably going to make money from just operational profit, and you'll be happy as the first investor. But this is this is for tech startup, the kind of startups that we are talking about here. Sorry. No, no, no. It doesn't need to be a series. So it, uh, normally, you you put into uh, the, the 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 document the amount of equity investment that has to be in aggregate achieved before the 
conversion right uh, is triggered. And I say conversion right, that's, that's not the right word because it's not debt that's converted, but technically you get the right to subscribe to a number of new shares at par value that, that, would, that you would get if you had converted a loan the same amount. And we're getting to the, we're getting closer to the end, so I have to, to run a little bit forward. Uh, but but the, the point is here that, that uh, if you look at this, it's extremely easy. You could just have this document and you can go to outside there and just put in a number. Uh, if, you, if you believe in the company, if you believe in uh, that it will go on to the next round, you believe in the business case, you don't have to do uh, much else than just agree on the, the amount that is going to be invested, the valuation cap, the discount, and there's also a couple of other details. For instance, if there is no uh, investment uh, or equity investment, qualified investment taking place, you need to convert at a certain state and you need to agree in the beginning uh, what, what should be that amount. And normally it would be something about the valuation cap, maybe minus a discount or something like that. But this is also tricky because the reason why you might not have reached that the need for an equity investment might not be because you're not able to get funding, but because you don't need it. And then you might actually be even more worth. So it's a little bit, you have to, you have to think about that when you decide what the maturity date conversion rate should be. Yeah, uh, I, again, definitely, if there's a longer period envisioned, uh, then the discount will be higher. Have you seen any actual correlation, like numbers? No, no, I would say that, that when I said 30 to 35, uh, it would be, I would say, closer to, to 30 if it's 24 months, and closer to 35 is 36 months. But again, this is just a general trend, because it might be that it's a very, very interesting company, where it's not envisioned that you need that next investment because it's a very they're already on a uh, uh, generating a lot of cash, so it 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 might be that it, in certain cases it goes the other way around, that you have to have a bigger discount if it becomes necessary quicker. Uh, but 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 again, uh, th this 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 is actually a pretty neat way of looking at it because you you take out a lot of the pain that you would have uh, in other investments. And so far, if you've got this document, so far, you don't need a lawyer. You just have to fill in this stuff. Obviously, you have to have uh, an educated market or ecosystem that understands how this works. But if, if you understand it, then you don't really need a, a lawyer to be involved here, um, at least in principle, because this has obviously to be applicable within different legal regimes. And No, but, uh, but, but you should also, you should talk to uh, Okan from BTC, BTS, because he's doing, he's doing something, uh, it's, a, it's not exactly a warrant, but he's doing a convertible uh, document that, that very much is based on these principles. But, so we're doing something in, in uh, Northern Europe along these lines. Uh, we call it the hatch. And this is the, the, the level of creativity you will find from a lawyer, is figuring out the name. <laughs> but birds, bird and bird, birds are hatching, so it's called the hatch. But also because I'm an open source lawyer, so it's a recursive acronym like GNU, Unix. GNU is not Unix. Uh, it's the hatch agreement by two birds for capital hybrid. Very, very original. Uh, and it's actually, we've we actually been using it since uh, we, uh, build it uh, or, or drafted it uh, in, in 30 or 40 investments so far. Nordic Makers has been using it in 15, uh, and people in the ecosystem have been using it uh, for up to, I think, about 40 investments now in total. Uh, so it's beginning to, to get a lot of traction. Uh, what's more important, we see a lot of Hatch inspired documents. A lot of the other law firms are doing similar things. Uh, 
where the core idea of actually not, I mean, basing the valuation on a future valuation and getting uh, the, uh, not discussing the shareholders' terms to start with is, is becoming a kind of a, of a norm, not just from law firms, but also institutional investors and government funds. Because they are also seeing that, well, if you can save some money from lawyers and get quicker, less transaction costs, it's, it's very good. And I think also we can say that this uh, is now, an, uh, we could call it an agreed document, because Nordic Megas is a trendsetter within uh, angel investments. When I go out and present, present this document, I can tell some people that, it's that, why is, that safe documents are used by uh, Y Combinator, but then they will ask exactly, the, yeah, but can we use it in Denmark? And then I'll present this and I'll say, Nordic Megas are use it, and, and Nordic Megas and the people behind Nordic Megas, of course, except for me, are probably the most professional business agents you will find in the Nordics. So if they're using it, it's very difficult for somebody to say, no, it's not a good document. So it's becoming uh, uh, agreed, and also Copenhagen for the win uh, have sort of endorsed it as something that, uh, is, is, uh, that they can recommend their startups uh, to use. And then just a few words about wh why, why would I, as a law firm, uh, promote this? Uh, I think this is the quintessential open source business model. Uh, lawyers are, qu uh, are, regardless of whether you want to accept this or not, we are. Uh, probably the most pure open source business people as all, at all, because all the laws, are, everybody can see the laws, they're not something that we own. All the decisions by the court can be seen by anybody. And mostly all of the contracts are really uh, stolen from each other. <laughs> it's, de fact, it's de facto open source. So we, we can only make money if we are able to uh, do something on top of that. In principle, all of you people can say, well, we can do the same. We can read the laws, we can read the uh, decisions, and we can do the work for ourselves, but you're asking us because we d you don't want the hassle. Uh, so it is it's, it's open source, uh, basically. And what I decided was that I released this document, uh, the Hatch, under uh, a Creative Commons license. Creative Commons is a something uh, akin, it's a, it's a content, it's an open source kind of license for content, based on the same principles as open source licenses. And I released it under this special license, it's version 4 of the, of the license, but it's called by ND, which means that you can use it, everybody can take a copy of it, use it for wherever they want to use it for, commercial use, competitors can use it, they, they, only, they can take copies, give it to somebody else if they want to do that. They can change the parameters, I mean, the names and the numbers and so on. But they always have to acknowledge, the co maintain the copyright provision in the document and the license when they forward to somebody else. And they are not allowed to make uh, derivative works. They're not allowed to change it. Uh, because I don't want anybody to start changing it, because then everybody would change it, and then you, you, will, you would have 40 different versions, and then you need lawyers to tell you which one is the right one. But obviously, this is really great for us, because it means that we can say that everybody can use it, your, your own lawyers can use it, uh, we don't care. But obviously, <laughs> I, I, it's probably the same thing here, Turkey. there's not a lot of other law firms that want to use a document where they have to tell you, th their client, that it, they didn't do it, but a competitor did, uh, did the work. So w the startups loves it, but the other lawyers are not going to use it because they, they, they want to maintain uh, the, 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 the illusion that they've built the product from, from the beginning. So it's, it's actually a, a brilliant uh, uh, business model. And because I'm the licensed saw, uh, there's a lot of people coming back to me. I get maybe one or two mails every week from somebody to say, we got this document, it's really good, but can we change something in it? And I say, yes, you can change something in it, but then you need a commercial license to do it, and I have to do it. Uh, and that costs money. Uh, just like if somebody, you want somebody to, to uh, opt out of the GPL, or you want someone to make something on top of, 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 of Linux or something like that, a pure open source model. And everybody within tech startup community, they understand it because they, they, most of them are doing that kind of, uh, making that money in that kind of way of themselves. And everybody accept, okay, you give this to us for free. Obviously, we have to pay a, a, a fair amount for, for you to, to add something on top of it. And at the moment, we are in version 3.3. That means that always we, we, we hold some meetings with stakeholders in the city to, to say, well, um, 
what do you think about this? Uh, should we change something? Uh, and, and then we, we adapt it. And as, as you can see, we are in version 3.3. .3, so it's always been trying to reflect the preferences of, of the community. But with something like this, just like Linux, you need the benevolent dictator, the one where the box stops. And you can say, well, I hear what you're saying, uh, but I decide what's going to be changed by the end of the day, just like Linus Torvalds with respect to, to Linux. And, and I'm the benevolent dictator because I own the document. <laughs> but everybody can just, if they don't want to, if they think I'm, I'm an idiot, here we have the binary thing again. <laughs> but if they think that I'm an idiot, and a lot of people would probably think so, uh, then they, they can just do it themselves because everybody can take the principles and do their own document. But, but the trademark and the copyright belongs to the, uh, the owner of, of the document, just like with every open source program. So it's more or less the same. And this is where we are going. Uh, I, I really f find that this is extremely fascinating area where you sort of do this kind of legal hack uh, on documents. If you are in a system, almost every, oh, let me just finish. I mean, the hatch, you can actually do this without changing the articles of association. Uh, you can do it totally without having any lawyers involved. Uh, normally, in most legal systems, when you have some change in the capital structure of the company, you have to register it somewhere so third parties can actually see that there is somebody who has a claim on the equity in some way. You have to register warrants. And I guess it's the same thing here in Turkey. You also have to do that in Denmark. But we say, well, do you need that? Because that only adds some extra protection, but do you actually need that? And our conclusion was when we talked to the investors and we talked to everybody else, no, uh, that added protection, we can, we can remedy that by having all the shareholders, these are startup companies, so there are probably just three or four start uh, shareholders, sign personally that they will actually make sure that this will take place, the conversion will take, they are personally liable for the conversion to take place. And when you get, got the, this kind of, of, uh, of liability for everybody who's actually in charge of the company, then you don't need to put it into the article of association. So this is a document where you can just download it, sit around the table, r sign it, and then you're done. You don't need to involve anybody. And I think this, this is, uh, uh, we, we are almost there. Most situations, actually, people don't know, uh, are not sufficiently, sufficiently understanding the document, so they, they are asking their lawyers. But, but they, are, they are beginning to be people who are just using it. And you could also use it for sweat equity. I mean, if somebody is, uh, uh, if you have an, a developer and you want to give that person some stake in the future, you can use this and say, well, you send us an invoice, we'll pay you the invoice, you use the proceeds, and you get the hatch document for that. Next up, we're also trying to, to reinvent uh, the founders' agreements uh, along these lines to do something very, very simple. So initially, when just two or three guys are sitting somewhere and they want to do a project, they can sign this document and they are already, at this point, sort of have basics, the basic things in order. And this is before they actually make a company uh, because you don't want, you want people to think about these things the minute they are starting to collaborate and they shouldn't have to spend money on setting up a company at that point if it's not really going to be successful. But it's a good thing that they've actually done that already at this point. So, so they will have to say, okay, we are now starting this project. This project, we divide the ownership like this, 50% to you and 50% to me. We define our roles. We make an agreement that we will transfer all, ne uh, all the necessary prior IPR, and we have an agreement about the IPR that we're actually doing as part of that. And under certain conditions, this will be the actual shareholders agreement or the articles of association of a company that we will incorporate. So we have agreed on that already to start with. And this is really, the th this is my uh, pet uh, here. I, I've seen so much uh, happening with shareholders agreement where you made a shareholders agreement uh, or founders agreement between people who started a company and then suddenly one of the people who was part of it is not really relevant anymore. Either because it turned out that he was incom incompetent or it tur turned out that she was going to do something else or it turned out that uh, somebody got mad at each other. And then you have a situation where you want to proceed, but you cannot proceed because there's somebody who can, can actually hijack the, 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 the project. And you have to ask lawyers, how do we get out of this and, and things like that. And I think most shareholders agreements are a, a little bit like marriage contracts 
that you think about them as, as though they are for life. But the fact is that most marriages, I don't know how it is in Turkey, but in Denmark, all, 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 more than half of the marriages are actually broken up relatively early. So why don't we actually make these kind of documents reflecting the fact that also so many things are happening in the initial period of a startup project Uh, Intergenous or exogenous, I mean, things happening within the sect, within the people, and people, the market can change, pivoting, and all these kind of things. And really, the most important part is to make sure that these, this project can actually adapt and move on with other people, if necessary, than they were part of it initially. And if, if there's not a clause on renegotiation, you will end up in this situation that somebody will be able to hijack and blackmail the others into a position that in a lot of situations is actually killing the project. So what we are trying to do here is to say, well, you decide in this document that after two years, you have to renegotiate your positions, and if you don't, need, uh, uh, if you don't reach any this, uh, agreement on that, you will have to have a uh, Texas shootout auction uh, where uh, if we had a company together and we didn't agree, uh, I could say, well, I think we have to go this way, i want to buy your shares. And you have the other way to say, okay, then I'll buy your shares at the same amount. So, and so we get some forced recognition. And in many situations, this is exactly the, the thing that brings reasonable people to the negotiating table. But it also means that there is actually a way that the guy who has, or the, uh, the guy who has the most value invested in the project and is more important for the project going forward can go to investors and say, Give them money, and I can actually trigger uh, that we continue with the with the cap table that you can live with. Yeah, and and obviously all this is going to be uh, we don't know the, the the right word of it uh, uh, for the but all these things that we are going to put into uh, already started put into some kind of a service where that uh, where all these documents are there uh, for free uh, on a freemium model and a premium model like software as a service thing again because as a law firm. This would be a tremendous funnel for work. If we can get so much work uh, where the marginal cost of uh, serving another customer is zero, where the customer acquisition costs are, are very small, we should do this. And you can see this is actually just what I've been telling you about the way to look at these products and services is, is, is really just taking our own medicines. If we are, if we are advising st software startups that are working with open source and are doing software as a service, and we cannot really see how we can use that for our own project, then how the hell should we be able to advise them uh, on things like that? But this is really just to say, okay, uh, we have to face that a lot of things are going to zero, a lot of things are being commoditized, a lot of things are based on open source uh, things where you can add value is on top of things if you put things in a service that is where the uh, marginal cost of adding another customer is zero if you can do that you can get a huge funnel and then you convert a couple of these into paying customers and then you make money no we we are starting out of the nordic we're starting out of denmark Then taking Helsinki, there's Finland and, and, and Sweden, because it's more or less the same numbers. And then we're trying to expand. Like we, we have a hatch document, a German version and a UK version, and a Finnish, a Swedish version already. But we want to take this out. out. But you can understand, and, but don't quote me on this. If you are part of a big international law firm, you should do things under the radar until it's got a su sufficient traction. Uh, then it becomes a fait accompli, and then you can start doing it. Uh, and, and this is, uh, I guess, also how startups works generally. You have to sort of do things until you become unavoidable. And this is uh, the ambition within. <laughs> this is my own business model within Bird and Bird to do this. Suddenly, it's, you cannot be ignored, and then everybody has to, to do it. In, in principle, you have uh, the CEO is running around saying that we should do legal tech and so on. Uh, but, but like in every big corporate structure, uh, the CEO is saying something to placate all the stakeholders, not necessarily having an ownership in, in actually doing things. Don't quote me on all this. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> no, but, but obviously Bird and Bird uh, has a strategy in general saying that we want to enable uh, companies to, uh, to transform digitally because we are uh, probably the best tech and IPR law firm worldwide. So we have to do something like this ourselves. Yeah, 
that that's that's definitely a risk, but at least we can run it in out of the Nordics uh, because they they're the the DNA of the Nordic uh, pa uh, law offices of Bird and Bird is so much making legal advice to startups and SMEs because of the the the, the Nordic economy has a huge uh, number of s small and medium sized companies that are profitable. But it would be nice if you spoke highly about an issue like this to the guys in Singapore. <laughs> Thank you. If, if you have any questions, then feel free to file. No, but it's 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 the, the challenge here is of course always to make sure that a document like this is is find its its place in the legal legal infrastructure. One of the questions we st that are still finally unresolved in Denmark is the legal treatment, because uh, obviously we want to make sure that the premium you pay to get the right to subscribe to these warrants at par value that that premium is treated as part of your acquisition cost of the uh, shares. Uh, and that is normally the case if you, if you pay a warrant premium, then if you sell the shares that you exercise your right to subscribe to later on, then the premium will be part of your acquisition cost. Uh, and this, this everybody tells us that this is the case, but we, we haven't had a binding uh, answer from the Danish tax authorities on this yet. The other aspect is, of course, we, how is the, uh, the premium treated within the startup companies? And also here, again, we want to be sure that it's treated the same way as a premium on, on a warrant normally is, that it's part of the equity, that it's not something that it's taken as income. Uh, and and th this this should be clear, but, but there is a little bit uh, of a... Uh, a, a cloud hanging over this uh, because we didn't have we didn't get the final decision by the tax authorities with all the auditors that we talk about say that they agree about this so if i do a cm with a convertible note with a normal company and the company collapses i would have a claim on their assets as the debt holder what happens in a safe in a safe note with and my claim would be superior to someone holding equity up to the low value no the not with the safe document not with the safe document no because you are an investor you are not a lender That that's obviously a huge problem. Yeah. Shareholder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that this is this is an area where, if you if you you can you can you can do a legal hack on this. You can create the documents, and you just have to be sure that these documents are accepted by everybody as the right way of doing it. Because obviously, if you, if there's some one sole law firm is saying this is the way we're going to do it, then everybody will say no, it cannot be done. Because that's their interest in saying that. But you need this is one of the reasons why you need these documents to be endorsed by everybody. It's got to be a community effort, uh, or it's got to be uh, adapted by some of the the most influential investors to start with. Because if you're just doing it f without any support, then nobody's going to believe that. Then then there's a strong incentive for all stakeholders uh, within the law firms to say it cannot be done. And but but I think but I think that this this uh, we also, you can imagine in Germany, the part 
that uh, left out the need for the uh, change of the articles of association was especially trick, uh, uh, problematic there because they, there, there's a whole industry that's called notaries. Uh, and they make all their money because you have to put things into the articles of association and register somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure we haven't we have we have a document there, uh, but but this was really we really thought about a long time about that and uh, reached the conclusion that you could actually do this without involving the notary. We haven't been using it in Germany so far, so I'm not, I cannot say that it's it's totally valid and usable. But this this is, this is the kind of legal, innovative work you have to be able to do. And again. The good thing here is that this is not a document that should be used by institutional investors that are investing other people's money. But if you're using it within a startup section where it's used by angels that are investing their own money, then you can look at these people and say, okay, you're, you're adults, you're grown-up people, do you want to accept the risk of this? And most people will actually say, yes, we'll use it because it's the, 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 the added benefit of eliminating that risk is smaller than the cost we have to pay if we have want to el eliminate it. And this, this is... Yeah. Sorry? No. And, and in Denmark, we could see with these Nordic makers people, they, they, would, they say, well, we know this, we, we are familiar with this document already from Y Combinator. We can see that there might be some risk here. There's also some more risk that the, 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 the startup will cheat us or something like that. Uh, because we don't have the ownership rights or anything, we just have we just have a warrant. Uh, there is some 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 so small protection in the document for, for certain decisions, but otherwise we just have the warrant. But they realize that they have a relatively large amount of money to invest, and the individual investments are relatively slow, low, so it doesn't really need to be that protected. And more importantly, they know that their protection is not ever going to be most importantly embedded in the contract but in their reputation. They know that the startups are not going to treat them well because we put it in a contract, but because they know that if they don't treat them well, they will never get funded anywhere else. So, so, so this is a document you use in a professional setting. It's, it's at the moment where the ecosystem here is sufficiently sophisticated that you also have these individuals who, who, who want to say no, despite all our traditional lawyers say, no, oh, there's this, this, this problem, we'll take the risk because we, 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 we don't think this is a big problem.